Black Hawk Down, as the opening first title says, is based on an actual event. And really, during the process of directing, making, putting together this story, I kept being reminded of that. The fact that it was recent history, it was 1992 to 93, and of the seriousness of the occasion. So I couldn't go down the conventional route of, uh, you know, for want of better description, and this isn't derogatory at all, but Hollywood dramatization of a war movie. In fact, the, one of the most difficult things was actually finally pinning down the beginning of the film, because I'd shot this footage on the last two days of Prince of Photography in Morocco, thinking that I would add to that with still photographs and other tricky, you know, graphic design montage uh, to tell the story. And we went in circles on that. Eventually, I decided to give up and simply go with what I shot because I felt at the end of the day, this was certainly powerful enough and got any audience's attention with that very compelling opening image, particularly when it was accompanied by the voice of the Senegal singer, Baba Ma. And so the film opens with a lament, which is singing about the condition of Africa in, in brief. And clearly, even if you can't understand what he's singing, you get the gist of what he's singing when it's actually, you know, run with these images. At this juncture in the film, which really was the end of principal photography, I almost felt I'd been a war photographer and uh, a journalist, and therefore that's why these opening titles are quite dry, statement of fact, almost like extracts from a newspaper. It's worth noting that um, the figures on the ground, in fact, you know, were not real, if that passes through your mind. Uh, the figures, the dying or dead, were in fact um, made by the special effects department. And so it was with good makeup. And these figures of rubber, actually, where I managed to put a pipe inside one so you could see his solar plexus actually moving as he breathed. So rest easy, they aren't real people. The only thing I knew about uh, Somalia back in, in October of 93 uh, was what I saw on CNN, which was um, these bodies being dragged through the streets as young American servicemen uh, who had been killed. And that's about it. That's all I, I had any recollection uh, about um, Somalia. I, I do remember Durant in his interview by uh, Adid's men that was also broadcast on CNN. And then I remember that uh, he was eventually released. But that's it, until I read uh, Mark Bowden's book. This reconstruction of a series of actually months, even years, of the process of trying to distribute food and get food in an efficient and humane manner to the people who are actually in need of it. And in fact, many are starving because the food was systematically distributed and then withheld. It was taken back, which is really why the Americans started to intervene in the first place under the George Bush senior regime. This is just prior to this particular story commencing, because this particular story took place in October 1993. We went in for all the right reasons. You have to understand that 300,000 people have already died of starvation. We sent in 20,000 Marines to distribute the food. Uh, what was happening is when the Red Cross went in there and started handing food out, the uh, various warlords uh, would steal the food in order to buy ammunition and uh, feed their armies, and everybody else was starving. So we went in, created order, got food distributed, saved 200,000 lives. Then we negotiated, or the UN negotiated a truce between a number of the warring tribes, uh, and we left. Unfortunately, um, one of the, of the warlords decided that he was going to take over the country, uh, started stealing the food again, and it was right back, being back in business again the way he was uh, before we got there. Uh, his name was Mohammed Adid. Uh, the United Nations um, wanted to create a peace, which they were unsuccessful in doing. Uh, Adid went out and targeted American personnel and killed some U.S. Marines, and then he killed and skinned 24 Pakistani UN peacekeepers. Uh, that enraged the UN. The UN went to pass a resolution um, in the United Nations to bring a deed to justice. Um, and the UN went to Bill Clinton, 
our president at the time, and said, uh, we want your military to go in and extract the deed. Clinton agreed, sent in a force of uh, U.S. Delta and Rangers and the Night Stalkers to disrupt a deed's operation and bring him to justice. Um, they'd been there approximately six weeks, uh, had some very limited success uh, because of poor intelligence, but had captured one of his key lieutenants, Osman Otto, and uh, had some information on his other key lieutenants in a meeting that they were having uh, that they assumed was accurate, but they never, they never know what's accurate or not because of who they're dealing with, even though they withhold the money until the operation is successful. Uh, you just don't know if they're being set up for an ambush. Uh, so this is how, I guess, the, the lead-in to October 3rd happened. The whole film was actually shot, I would say, no further than 20 minutes radius of Saleh. So whilst this looks like it's in the middle of the Mogadishan Desert, it's actually less than probably half a mile from the building site where we actually shot the end run. This is a pretty good uh, representation of what you'd call scrub desert and heat, um, which is fairly accurate for both Somalia and the Sudan. So the first sequence um, where we see the arrest of Osman Atto, Osman Atto, who is the character you see in the scene, is uh, being interviewed by General Garrison, who is the commander in charge in Mogadishu at this point. And Osman Atto is uh, a real character who, at this particular moment in Mogadishu, we believe it's reported, and, um, all of this stuff is reported, so the 100% accuracy of it is maybe questionable. But Osman Atto at the moment actually is in Mogadishu. Um, at this point in time, he's really having a go for premiership because if you'd constitute anyone as the premier in Somalia, that would be uh, Farah Adid's son, who was a American-trained Marine who ended up working in the state of California before his father was assassinated. And then the son was then taken back to Somalia, where he became the leader. By the documentary, I saw him, he looked fairly reluctant. <laughs> Six weeks you are trying to catch the general. So in this, we have information which is giving us both with the opening sequence, we're giving, getting a state of play, and the scene with Osmanato, we're being told that it's fundamentally none of our business and we should keep our noses out of this. And uh, this is our war, not your war. And the upshot is that General Garrison simply says that uh, 300,000 dead and counting is not a war, Mr. Ato, it's genocide. And they intend to stop it. Whoever it takes to arrest, they will stop this particular, you know, process. Sam, I've never worked with before. Sam Shepard is playing General Garrison. Never worked with him. Um, uh, it was a real pleasure uh, in that I fully expected one of the great American playwrights to come in and alter everything, and he didn't. He was actually as good as gold and um, uh, was always very much involved. And so I considered it a really interesting and pleasant partnership. In fact, this gentleman, Arto, was cast out of London. In fact, after this, was going to New York to play in a Harold Pinter play. So that just shows the magic of uh, movie making and uh, casting, <laughs> because he certainly looks the business. Here we have more information between Garrison and Cribs. Cribs, in fact, was Lee Van Arsdale, but uh, Lee was less comfortable with actually having his name used in the process of the movie, and therefore we give him the name Cribs. Lee Van Arsdale was a, a Delta who was in charge of Delta Force, or Ground Force at this particular moment, and um, and therefore was, you know, seconded, I guess, to an under General Garrison. Lee Van Arsdale was Colonel Lee Van Arsdale, so this, this would be Colonel Cribs. We hired Bonnie Timmerman as our casting director, and um, she brought in such a variety of young actors from all over the world because she felt that some of the European faces uh, were, were even more interesting than the American faces. So we had a combination of both uh, foreign talent and American talent. Yeah, the cast in this is actually 
mixed in the sense of we have uh, American, of course, we have Australian in Eric Bana, who's Hoot in the film, and we have English, um, and one of the Delta is Danish. Uh, so it was a very mixed cast. Um, uh, there was no real reason for that. I've been asked why was it so mixed, and I said, uh, basically, you know, the best man got the job. All these guys were fluent in English, and in today's world, any actor who decides to adopt an accent, uh, they they usually, you know, really take it to heart, and they go to they go to school. They go to school f just with a dialogue coach, and um, it's a, it's a matter of work to get it down to where you want it to be, and uh, you know you can even decide which state you want to choose to take on as an accent. So it, it's quite a refined process. Whereas 25 years ago. People would say, yes, I have no problem doing an American accent, or yes, I have no problem doing an English accent. And of course, that's where we always heard awful American accents and awful English accents. Ewan McGregor is somebody that um, Bonnie said we should try to get him. I think his agent was, was pushing for him to, to, to be in the picture because Ridley was directing it. And he was somewhere in South America, and we'd sent him the script and never heard a word. And then we sent him the book. And once he read the book, uh, he said, I want to be in this picture. And Eric Bana is somebody that our company had spotted when he did a movie called Chopper. Sat down with him and talked to him and felt he'd be, he'd be great for the, the character called Hoot. Um, and, you know, Ridley saw Chopper too, remembered him, and, and said, You're, you know, let's get involved with him, let's do it. And then the rest of the, the cast kind of came together uh, with discussions with Ridley and Bonnie. Um, um, you know, Sam Shepard is somebody that was our first choice and we wanted him. Um, and, and the rest of the kids uh, just came in and gave great readings or had unique looks. A number of them I've worked with in the past, uh, Ewan Bremner is somebody that was in Pearl Harbor and I knew he was just a terrific actor and really loved him. Uh, Tom Sizemore is such a great personality and is perfect for McKnight. Again, Ridley was aware of his work and, and liked him when he came in. Um, and you know, then he had some people that I, I guess were, were holdovers from some of his other pictures that he wanted to use. So um, we sat for months really. Uh, screening actors, talking to actors, and trying to put together a really interesting cast that was unique, and I think we accomplished that. Class, man, very slow. Single shot for the engine block. Shit, that's a shame that was a nice cheat. While I was making Pearl Harbor, I had given the book to Josh Harden and said, I really think that this character of Eversman, if we can get it right in the script, is something you should play. He called me after he read the book and said, oh, God, I love the book. And he said, when you get a script, why don't you send it to me? And when I met with Ridley, I said, we have this kid in Pearl Harbor. Chances are you haven't seen him. But you really should, A, look at a piece of the movie because the picture hadn't been released yet, and then sit down and talk to him. And then Ridley and I took a meeting with Josh and, and sat and talked to him. And, and Ridley said, this is really an earnest kid and uh, somebody I think is, is talented and we should work with him. Uh, so then we had convinced Josh that this was the right thing for him to do because Josh is kind of worried of becoming a movie star. Uh, and just wants to be an actor and not have all the notoriety. But I think Pearl Harbor, once once that opened, kind of changed his life. But And coming back with another uh, movie that has the potential of being a success because of, of Ridley being involved uh, scares a young actor. But fortunately for us, we were able to convince him to do the film, and, and he got involved. One of the deal breakers initially, dealing with the Defense Department, who were rather embarrassed about the fact that we revealed that Delta might hunt wild pigs with rifles, uh, particularly as they're using taxpayers' gasoline and one taxpayer's bullet. But my argument was that if these guys have been there six weeks, they've been eating nothing but fish out of the Indian Ocean, and that any form of meat was going to be really welcome. So we, I finally won with this one. When they saw it in context, they, they accepted the fact it was quite relevant. Hey, man, there's a line. I know. This isn't the back of it. Yeah, I know. Sergeant. Sergeant. What's going on here? So here on screen you have an Australian on the right, Eric Bana, and you have Jason on the left, who is playing Captain Steele, who's English. But I think both sets of accents are fairly foolproof. They're both playing Southern characters. Let it go, sir. The guy hasn't eaten in a couple of days. You Delta boys are a bunch of undisciplined cowboys. Let me tell you something. The place that they're in right now is the hangar, and uh, the hangar was their meeting place, food place, uh, recreation place. They slept on cots, as you'll see, 
and what you see is absolutely accurate and is based on what we saw from uh, photographs from Bogadish and how, in fact, they survived. Everything was kind of coordinated, but an, really a lash-up in terms of they would supply them as many things they could, like table tennis tables, recreational um, uh, pursuits. But for the most part, they were there all anxious to actually get started and do the job. <laughs> These two characters are Shugart and Gordon, who uh, uh, I'm not sure were chess players, but um, what I thought was actually interesting that uh, we decided to characterize, and Steve Zellin anyway, characterize these two guys as chess players the same way as you have the two pilots arguing about Scrabble. So if you think about that kind of information, it means that they're on hold, they're really waiting. And when it's now got reduced to drawing pictures, writing books, playing chess, and then later, breaking arms playing table tennis, then it means the table tennis game is pretty rough. Uh, and so, obviously, this all expresses a form of frustration and, and uh, you know, when are we going to get started? You know, we're here to do a job and we're not able to do the job. So I think there's a certain amount of frustration attached to all of them. They were, they were a little bit, I think, on a wire. You understand? Can you count? One, two, ten. Okay. Where am I running back? Steel, which was Captain Steel, um, who basically was in charge of chalks, um, that would be Lee Van Arsdale would be above him, but Steel, once they're on the ground and in battle, Captain Steel would be in charge of ground forces in battle. So uh, Lee Van Arsdale would be watching their progress uh, from the, what they call the JOC, which is the operations center where the whole insertion and then, which, which then of course deteriorated into battle, uh, would be photographed and watched from the air. And once you're in process, then Captain Steele would be in charge because he's, he's with the guys on the ground. Steele wasn't necessarily a popular man, played it by the book. Um, he had his rule book and he stuck to it. Um, didn't bend the rules and uh, ha had a habit of using a lot of football and sporting expressions and uh, discussions in terms of how he was going to function, how his boys were going to function when they hit the ground running. So there was definitely a kind of tension between the group that have to be regarded as superior in terms of their experience and uh, battle experience, and that would be the Delta, the slightly older guys who are, had been fundamentally shot at and had shot at people and therefore had had battle experience. But most of these other guys, these rangers, had no battle experience whatsoever, but were super trained to go through a process and, of course, prepared as much as you can be prepared to know what it's like when you get shot at. Because, as Hoot says, once that first bullet goes past your ear, all politics and all that shit goes right out the window. It's all about the man next to you. We can sit back and watch country destroy itself on CNN. Right. I don't know about you guys, but I was trained to fight. You trained to fight, son? Well, I think Josh Hartnett, I would guess, is the um, character in the film that would be, in terms of normal movies, classified as the leading character, even though uh, he's on and off screen uh, at fairly regular intervals. This film is not conventional in the sense of having conventional characterization where you know, the film is subsequent to the good guy and the bad guy, and everybody else revolves around those two characters. This was very much a film which was a team effort, because as it was, we were taking a hundred functionaries, protagonists, and we were distilling them down as far as we could get to tell a cohesive story. And uh, where we got to was the, I couldn't get it much below about 37 characters, which by normal standards is about 32 characters more than you ought to have and so that was tricky and that was something I was always concerned about that would people be prepared or would they want to follow these guys who are coming and going and then you know re-emerging during the process of the story would they eventually be able to hang their hat on you know sympathetically their sympathetic hat or curiosity or interest 
on these characters when there was a large team rather than specific individuals. But I think Josh did a great job, and actually he does stand out as to what he's, I think, probably predestined to be, and that, I would think, is probably a big star, big movie star. Elements about him in terms of his uh, dignity and thinking process as a person, not just as an actor, um, that is oddly reminiscent of uh, the behavior of uh, Gary Cooper. Um, so can you learn that or are you just born with it? That's always the eternal question. I think you're born with it, actually. This guy, again, whilst he looks great, looks local, isn't. He's from London. <laughs> and uh, we have in the film, in GRC, when Garrison says, refers to this level of unreliable intelligence, he describes the guy he'd actually had until a month ago who had actually blown his brains out playing Russian roulette in a bar, where clearly he'd been drunk and had been challenged and he'd killed himself. That was the quality of intelligence, and uh, these guys are here to do a job, and they're being pressed by the government to say, get on with it, because it's expensive to have you there. And his argument is, yeah, but there's nothing to get on with. But they are being put through the press and have to do something. So Garrison eventually, I guess, is pressured into making decisions maybe quicker and uh, maybe taking a view on chances that he would not normally take. I don't know. I mean, I'm only speculating on that one because I never talked to General Garrison or as to what he felt about the event or this film. Tom Sizemore playing Colonel McKnight, uh, head of the Humvee column, and the trucks that will be moved in to pick up and take away the prisoners and the rest of the team. That's all the chalk for, guys all hopefully untouched, all hopefully unwounded, and, of course, that was not to be. So now we're getting the plan in what would be called the JOC. Uh, this is the basically the ops room, operation center. He's briefing key personnel, which are Delta and some officers, um, with his hopes, fears, and expectations of what's going to go down. Um, he has the air recon maps, and uh, they know to a certain extent where the building is. At the moment, they don't know specifically which one it's going to be, but it's going to be somewhere along this street within about two or three blocks of where they hope it'll happen. So everybody is primed for that target. Many guns and 275 rockets. And C2 Bird. Matthews will coordinate the air. There's a predetermination in the scene with the guys who are uneasy about the mention of the Bakara Market. The Bakara Market was the center of the old city of uh, Mogadishu, which had basically was the sanctuary for, let's say, the worst of the enemy, the most organized of that group, and the most armed or overarmed of that particular group. Going into the Bakara Market was like going into the Wild West frontier town. It was really dangerous and uh, no law and no order. Don't underestimate their capabilities. Now we'll be going through friendly neighborhoods before we hit the market. So remember the rules of engagement. No one fires unless fired upon. Let's go get this thing done. Good luck, gentlemen. We took over the actual base in Morocco, which is the military base which, you know, a lot of these North African hangars are very standard and very part of code of the... These hangars could have been in California. Looked exactly the same. I think they were probably built by American engineers, maybe in the 50s, for the Moroccan army. Um, and were quite well maintained, and uh, so it was perfect for us. I figure if you're going to follow a car, all you need is two or three cars with ratty old white roofs from the air, you're going to lose them. So I thought a very simple symbol on the top of the car and gaffer tape would be fine. You know, in, in other words, a black cross. All these Blackhawks are, of course, military. They 
came over on these giant air buses that were sent over and came over from Kentucky when we finally finished a rather prolonged uh, negotiation between us and the Defense Department. In fact, I'd been shooting for a month by the time I actually got full permission to actually, you know, have the use of the Blackhawks. And uh, so in that time, I was shooting stuff which didn't require Blackhawk or helicopter work, but it was getting more and more anxious as we approached the point where I suddenly we'd say, okay, tomorrow I need four Blackhawks and four Little Birds. <laughs> but we'd had German aircraft standing by. We had Hueys in Germany. We had all our spray paint poised to start spraying them in this kind of dark bottle green color. But fortunately, we never had to go, go that far. When we were getting ready to commit to Pearl Harbor, what we had to do was get the assistance of the U.S. military, both the Army and the Navy who controlled Pearl Harbor. Uh, so we went to the Secretary of the Defense um, under Clinton and William Cohn, uh, and we started talking about Pearl Harbor. And then he turns to me and he says, I understand you bought the book Black Hawk Down. And I said, yes, I did. And he said, I love that book. Okay, so we knew we had the Secretary of Defense who loved the book. Um, we talked to a number of other military men at the, at, the, at the Pentagon, and we were tipped to the fact that Hugh Shelton, who was the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was also a fan of the book. Uh, so we had two advocates already in very high places um, to help us with the acquisition of, of the helicopters and the Rangers that we needed. Uh, but unfortunately for us, that administration had changed, uh, and William Cohn was gone, and Donald Rumsfeld was in, but Shelton was still in, in, in power at the, at the time. And uh, we arranged a meeting with him and some of his lieutenants and um, told him exactly what we needed. And he said, look, I'll do whatever I can to help you get this picture made because I feel uh, it shows um, the courage and bravery of the young men who were stuck in this terrible situation. Uh, so uh, that's how it began. It, it kind of disintegrated from there, but uh, that's where it began. We had a number of meetings with Phil Strube, who's you know the, the liaison for film with the, with the Pentagon, and he, they were very helpful in, in you know going through our screenplay and showing us uh, certain errors that we made um, in, as far as referring to officers and men, enlisted men, just you know simple protocol that uh, anybody in the military would know that we got wrong. Once Phil Strube approves it, um, it starts going up the chain of command, and since we knew we had the top covered, we weren't sure about Rumsfeld, but um, I think Shelton, being a fan of it. Uh, I'm sure uh, helped with Rumsfeld. So that part of it was working fine. It's when we got to Morocco and said we're bringing in uh, 100 U.S. Rangers and we're bringing in uh, eight helicopters uh, that things got real sticky. We felt we had all the documentation to present to the Pentagon and the State Department that they needed, uh, but there was a woman in the um, embassy in Morocco who had other ideas. And uh, she was the charge A, and, and uh, the ambassador had, had recently left because of a change of administration, and Bush hadn't put anybody new in there. And she really didn't want anything to go wrong on her watch. And the last thing she needed was a movie uh, to disrupt her moment of power. So in a very nice way, she said she would help us, but um, kept demanding more and more paperwork. Uh, once we got one piece of paperwork, there was always something else that she needed, uh, but never told us that in advance. And, you know, when you work with a... Um, with a foreign government like Morocco, things move, move very slowly since the king is at the head of it and kind of has to filter to him and go through a lot of hands before it gets to him. Uh, so we, first she asked for a, a piece of paper from the head of the military. Uh, we had a number of military signatures already on our documents, but that wasn't good enough. She had to have the head of it. Uh, it took us two weeks. Uh, through the help of our friends in Morocco, we got it. Uh, then she came to us and said, well, there's really no agreement between Morocco and the United States, which is called the SOFA agreement, which if you bring American troops onto foreign soil, um, there has to be some agreement of who has jurisdiction over these troops. Uh, what happens if something goes wrong with one of the soldiers? What, what courts? Is it the American courts he goes to or the Moroccan courts? Who protects the helicopters and the men while they're there? Um, since you're not supposed to be armed in Morocco, they're not supposed to have any guns. So that started. Then the lawyers got into it. You know, when lawyers get into things, things get really messy. Um, and, you know, thanks to the pressure from Tom Matthews, who kept walking it desk by desk through the Pentagon, and the help of um, Sony's, um, I guess, government relations, uh, we got an enormous support from Jesse Helms, 
who, who sent letters to the Moroccan government on our behalf and to um, the State Department on our behalf, and a congressman from California who actually called the woman and got her out of bed at 2 in the morning and said, this is going to happen or you're not going to be there. And that, all of a sudden, the next morning we get a call and let's have a meeting. So things started to progress. But still, you know, there was always sticking points. So we, we had so many false alarms that the containers were packed, the men were on their way, and then there was some something that had to be signed that wasn't signed that uh, had to get done. And, and all this is going on while Ridley's filming. So he had to wait four weeks before he got the helicopters. And, and the ADs had scheduled the helicopters, I think, in the second week. So we kept pushing things forward to shoot prior to the helicopters. And sure, it put a lot of unfortunate stress and, and strain on Ridley and the production. But, you know, they're such professionals, the people that Ridley works with and himself, that, you know, they know how to roll with the punches. They know how to, you know, uh, they know what's important. And the production team had already gotten a number of UEs out of Germany. They already painted black just in case we couldn't get the Blackhawks. And I guess we're going to change the name of the movie to UE Down. But fortunately, that didn't happen. After this long wait of, for me, it was almost five months working on getting this thing uh, accomplished with, with the Pentagon and the State Department and the Moroccan government, that the hel helicopters arrive. And, you know, they're on the tarmac there, and, and one of the pilots who, I guess, knew who I was kind of points at the two choppers and says, take a look at their names. And uh, one was called Armageddon, the other one was called Gladiator. And I honestly thought it was a joke. I thought that they painted them on there. Uh, for our benefit, but that's n it's not true. There's a, the names that they named the helicopters when they got them, so um, it's kind of that was a good luck charm. Once that first bullet goes past your head, politics and all that shit just comes right out the window. During one of the meetings, I met a, a young colonel, and he was very articulate and had been in Somalia. He was head of the air operations uh, in Somalia. He was up in the air for 18 hours during the battle, and his name was Tom Matthews. And he um, was helpful on our side, explaining to one of the other officers in the Special Forces that what we had in the screenplay was actually accurate. And I asked him, what do you, can you get out of the military? He says, well, I'm retiring in, in a month. And I said, would you consider uh, being an advisor on this movie and coming to Morocco with us uh, during the filming to, to show us um, the accuracy of, or help Ridley with the accuracy of, of the picture? He said, let me think about it, and he wasn't sure if he wanted to get involved with Hollywood. Uh, it's, it's, it wasn't really, he's a real straight shooter, and it's not something that he thought uh, he would fit in very well and hadn't heard great stories about, uh, about the process. He went home to his wife, and his wife said, are you kidding? You better go and do this. Uh, uh, so he joined us, and um, we also contacted the head of the, uh, the Delta Force, who was who was responsible for his men in in Somalia, and so between the two of them, Ridley had two bookends: uh, one who was on the ground for the battle, and one who was in the air for the battle to make sure we got everything right. If I go closer, they might shoot me. The uh, two characters that I was very happy to have, who went through the process of the Battle of Mogadishu, were played by uh, Stephen Ford, who played the character Cribs, who that in fact was Colonel Lee Van Arsdale. And the pilot, the man in the air in charge of air to ground, was Colonel Tom Matthews, who was played by, uh, I think, Glenn Morshauer. They were representing Matthews and Lee Van Arsdale. But I had the two, the two guys, the real thing, all, always with me. Um, during processing what I call video village, which is all my monitors. If there's 11 cameras, I've got 11 monitors. And of course, on playing back, I would include uh, Lee Van Arsdale and Tom Matthews to give their opinion. And uh, it was interesting because it was all process, all procedure. They never encroached, of course, dramatically. It was, it was great dealing with the real thing. I think it definitely contributed toward the authenticity of it all. And, um, you know, of course, in there we've uh, got a gentleman I've worked with before, Harry Humphreys, who also was the real thing, not at Mogadishu, but in fact was a veteran of quite a few experiences in Vietnam as a Navy SEAL. And uh, he does films for me as a ad military advisor and for Jerry Bruckheimer. Part of it's his knowledge and part of it, he's a very good man. So between the three of them, I used to have a fairly good view as to whether I was right or wrong. Because what I didn't want to do was to present these guys in any dramatized shape or form. I wanted to keep it as real and as documentary as I could make it.
So I think what was really interesting was to gradually realize that this low-tech taxi is connected with a high-tech helicopter that is receiving him and GOC, uh, where they're relaying the information and uh, on that basis they, they can then plan to make their next move. And so I, it was it almost became like a peculiar video game because there's all the players out there all playing towards the center and um, you know the end of the day there is a target and a winner and a loser so it becomes this kind of really awful game um, but these guys are here to risk their lives and risk their lives on behalf of a group of people who clearly even at this juncture really don't want them there even though you're getting starvation they'll still say well I have no answers to that which I think is strange because I think there's a very clear and concise answer when you see that, you know, such behavior being practiced in a very conscious way, in a conscious manner, you have to do something about it. You have to, if you're a community, you can step up and be counted, you've got to step in and do something. I have no problem about intervention, particularly when you're seeing, uh, you know, the results of what I saw in a book called um, Inferno, is a report by a photographer, a war photographer, uh, which he covers India, Somalia, and the Balkans. And uh, it is the most dismaying book, um, I think. It, 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 it's as dismaying as it gets. It's really upsetting to think that. And what's fascinating about it is to see people who are in the most critical and pitiful stage of of starvation and therefore clearly dying, that you're still getting people moving behind them, obviously with some um, other occupation going on. So when I see a person carrying a bag or a briefcase walking behind this person who's melting away into the earth, it's very strange and it's, does it need exploring? Absolutely. Does it really need looking closely at? Yes. Because clearly there's factions in here who are trying to kill other factions. And all this political correctness of saying, well, we, should we intervene or should we not intervene, in my opinion, is rubbish. I think we should intervene without any question. And particularly in cases like this now, particularly where the world is going, where the actual upside of this for the Americans coming out of here, there's no upside. There's only downside. Downside being you're going to lose lives. You're, you're going to take a bashing from the international community. None of them have stepped in and actually joined you in the process other than the UN, right? And I think uh, it's wrong. I think it should be obligatory, but put it in the hands of the most practiced. And um, by being multinational, then I guess we then, one way or another, do the most we can to avoid abuse of a process and an opportunity. There's always this fear of you're generating what essentially is two steps from a fascist or police state. But there's a moment when you're dealing with certain groups that you have to really think about, how can I deal with this because my enemy aren't a normal enemy. And uh, the scariest thing about them is there's no fear about dying. Um, they're here to make a demonstration uh, to the rest of the world as to who they are and what they represent. The uh, airport in Mogadishu actually was about three miles from the center of town. Uh, so that was, had been originally an American base and had been built by the Americans in, I think, probably the 70s, early 80s. Uh, had also been the international airport in Mogadishu at a point when Mogadishu was kind of called a holiday resort, which... Uh, took a lot of, particularly Italians, would go to visit Mogadishu and actually in the, I think, late 50s and maybe early 60s, it was a rather pleasant place to go onto the Indian Ocean, providing you kept an eye open for the sharks, which in fact were prevalent at that particular point. In brief, the history was the Russians came in 
of course, as communists took over, because there was association with Italian communism, came in and were in Mogadishu for Somalia for some time. And when they decided to leave, they left behind them what was supposed to be approximately a billion dollars worth of arms, firearms, bullets. And so, essentially, this, this could be perceived as being one of the most overarmed communities in the world where you'd have marketplaces, in fact, not selling food, but selling rocket-propelled grenades and missiles. Um, so it was a formidable place to take on board because against their lack of accuracy or specific training, uh, they made up for numbers. And clearly, a lot of these Somalian group were really very efficient. Just because somebody's running around in a bandana and... Uh, hasn't got on a formal khaki uniform doesn't mean to say that you can not take him seriously. And I think Garrison had a good sense and intuition to know that. Right? He knew that every minute they were on the ground was one minute closer to... The simile was actually picking up a wasp nest and shaking it and then holding on to it to see how many times you could get stung before you dropped it. Whilst all of this looks very difficult, um, in fact, the coordination of these choppers was made that much easier because I'm dealing with probably the best armed flight crews in the army. Um, we walked the street with these guys. They checked it out for half an hour, said no problem. Where do you want the helicopter? I said right here and here. And where do you want each of the fort flying fortresses, which are constitute the Black Hawks, given the position in the corner, the direction they must be? And action, they were there. <laughs> and there was a lot of rehearsal with actual rangers. So those guys you actually seen going down the ropes, not in close up, but in long shots, are actual rangers. Let's go, let's go! A lot of very good CGI work here. Some of it enhancement, like the dust on the right here, is all enhanced because I had to to have some kind of order and semblance of order. I knew a helicopter's coming in would have a tremendous amount of dust, but for me to shoot with a tremendous amount of dust, you just don't see anything. You're like in a white out or, or yellow out or, you know, dirt out. And uh, so I had to wet the ground so I could control the dirt. And then later, CGI-wise, we put in dirt. Because once those choppers come over that ground, I mean, the whole ground melts for about a foot. You lose about a foot of dirt from the last 30 years. And of course, there's a lot of dog dirt and a lot of you're breathing all kinds of stuff in. So there was a lot of care and attention taken on that. There's a lot of funny problems of, uh, you know, chest complaints and things like that, but I think we all survive. We put all the dust in here. We had to. You can't put that in and have people shooting on the ground. This is what Edmund said he froze for a second when he saw his man fall, which was not in the plan. And, um, uh, and you know, so you can gather the, an experience that any general who actually has got a plan of, of, you know, reasonable nature, when this starts to fall down, collapse, then he's looking for other solutions already. And of course, a lot of the problem was also communication, hearing very clearly what's going on. That's why Garrison said, what did he say? Because he doesn't know yet there's, there's a man on the ground. The order of the day is do not fire unless you're fired at. Reason for that being there was a lot of Somalian civilians they knew would be less prudent in terms of common sense in getting off the street when the soldiers arrived and therefore they had a feeling that there'd be a lot of civilian Somalians hanging around observing what the hell was going on. Of course, that's precisely what happened. So it's believed that uh, a lot of the Somalian soldiers would use civilian groups as shields to run behind them and shoot through them and over them 
and therefore making it very tricky and very difficult for the Americans to shoot back. Eventually, after a couple of Americans got hit, I think that all went out the window, and I think they all just let fly at anything that moved. The surprising thing is how many people stayed on the street and just simply did get off the street and get into the house. But there was so much high curiosity that it was like a war with an audience. Doc Smith's Hugh Dancy is an English actor who I'd seen on BBC, I think 18 months prior, I'd seen him do, I think, David Copperfield. That's what Garrison says, what do he say? So he doesn't quite know what the heck's going down. He doesn't see everything from the air. And also, of course, you're insulated from the real event from the air because you're not hearing any of the sound effects. You're not getting the flying bullets, the flying pieces of lead, and just the aggressive behavior of the crowd on the ground. You're seeing a lot of people running around, but you don't quite know, absolutely know what's going on. Any general has obviously got half an eye on the possibility of not just failure, but losing a man, losing men, maybe losing a helicopter. And if he doesn't, then he's a fool. Uh, because it, once you go to war, then Murphy's Law kicks in and you have a constant process of deterioration the longer you're there. And, uh, of course, any good general, any good leader would know that. And so time is of the essence here. So now they're in the captive building, uh, which is what I'd call in simple terms the town hall, where they caught a meeting, not of just three guys, but caught a meeting of 22 guys. So they didn't have good intelligence pictures of who they wanted, so they took the lot and slung them on board the, the trucks. And then, uh, so that automatically spoke for a lot of places that the guys couldn't get out later. If there'd been two guys that they had full recognition on, then they could have just stuck them on, you know, you'd have had more room in the trucks, basically. One of my biggest problems in casting was, it suddenly dawned on me that as soon as these guys have a crew cut, or, a, you know, a buzz cut, and then they put on a helmet and goggles and chin strap, you're starting to look the same. So that became very much a big concern, and uh, but at that moment, there's not much you can do about it. So you can only do as clarify as much as possible. Um, so I said, well, let's put names on helmets, front and back. And they said, we don't do that. And I said, but you did in Vietnam, I saw it. And he said, yeah, but that was then, this is now. So my argument was, well, this is because this is even more guerrilla. I think there's even more warfare. There's even more reason to acknowledge and recognize your teammates. And also from my point of view on the floor, I'd have been shouting, you know, oi you, rather than I could never, would never get his name because I may not be able to recognize him. But I think little by little during the film, through about into the beginning of the second act, you gradually start to get who is who, which I think is fine. You don't need any more backstory. This is about the event then, that night. You, you know, what else is there to be told? That is what the story is about. Also, this clarification of when you get a black hole coming in, and he's, he's spewing four and a half thousand shell casings a minute, and you're underneath. There's, I've heard of an unlucky fellow getting a red hot shell case down his shirt. So he's leaping around trying to get his shirt off to get the shell casing out, which is what I, I, I couldn't resist that kind of detail. So I had Josh do that for us. Also, in this chaos, I saw two children standing watching. And I thought that was irresistible um, because that's what would happen. You have two kids got trapped in that particular corner in that morning as American Delta come through the arch doorway and seemed to take over everyone, right? So I thought it was rather interesting. Here we have the first death. Pila was a, a gunner and was a popular man who uh, would, as shown in the um, hangar earlier, you see Pila 
basically doing a pretty good satirical view of uh, Captain Steele and the commanding officer, which, of course, is a very standard procedure. They all do that. Um, but Peeler, unfortunately, is the first guy to get shot, um, which they said all communication on the radio stopped for almost 20, 30 seconds, which sounded like an eternity, till somebody called back in as to where they are now and you know, broke the silence. But the silence was... Uh, he said was absolutely explosive. And uh, that's when Garrison, from that moment on, Garrison felt he was in real trouble. He felt he'd now gone past the allotted time and things are going to go downhill. This is the traditional in a sense of the hero returns and uh, fundamentally gives as good as he got. He's lost the man, but uh, I couldn't really resist the response. And uh, But then right on top of this response, you've got this efficient character coming through who is, in the book, characterized as sunglasses because they remember this man who seemed to be everywhere, who was always seen with a pair of, you know, fashionable, uh, whether they're fashionable or not, or whether they're just cheap sunglasses, knockoffs, uh, he was always in the sunglasses. They never never knew what his name was. But they think he was certainly responsible for one black hawk getting hit. So, we now have the first helicopter going down. Um, and uh, all of this is actual flying, with CGI added, the black oily smoke, um, is out of a CGI house, and of course, Bush struggling to hold himself in position inside is a, uh, it's basically a CGI blue screen background. But all the flying is live. He's doing this for real. And this is now beginning to have CGI mixed into it. Those distant shots of helicopters going across the roofs is. The little shots are CJ. From now on, when it hits the building, is CJ. The whole thing was replaced because we shot this using a mock-up dummy on a cable, on thick, heavy cables. Um, but really, I was going to get nowhere near what I wanted. I wasn't going to get the harshness or the the reality, that kind of visceral reality which happens on a eight-ton machines out of control. So all the image that was captured on film from the minute it was hitting the top of the building to when it comes to rest on the ground was essentially replaced with the CGI. So they used the maquette or the, the fake chopper as a kind of dummy to copy and then they basically removed it, got rid of it. Star 4-1 coming down and see if you can land at the crash site. Roger that, Star 4-1 inbound. I didn't want to forget Osmanato, so uh, I couldn't really resist covering that. That not so much that he knew or that he may have known that something had happened, because he didn't. But simply to put him in there after the first helicopter goes down is kind of interesting because it almost infers that he knows that these guys are going to be in trouble. Six four, I can't see the crash side. Over. Slavomir Idziak was a cameraman who worked quite often with Kozlowski, the Polish director, and uh, I'd seen a lot of the stuff and had been both very impressed by the director's work and Slav. And so I approached him very simply and said, uh, I'm doing this film about Mogadishu, are you interested? And he said, yes, please. And uh, we met and we got on with the film. Um, but, you know, we a lot of discussion in terms of the look and how it, the film, obviously, this takes no real second thought um, that the film should take on the shape and form of a kind of documentary. And that in there, there would be anywhere between 2 to 11 cameras on a regular basis. Very often, there'd be six cameras. You get used to being able to position 
pre-position cameras um, like I used to at BBC, I used to do live television broadcasts of plays, not just outside broadcasts, which is basically covering a sporting event, but actually pre-planning, pre-thinking as many as 350 shots to, in an hour's show and then literally writing your camera plot and camera plan. That was a marvelous process because it made me imagine way before I got there what I was actually going to shoot and how I was going to cover it and who was going to say what at what moment in close-up. And that has always come very easy to me, and I think that's probably because of early days in television, live TV, and plays, drama. Then, you know, later into television commercials, where for 18 years I operated camera uh, through to the first four features, and so, you know, quite obviously I know lenses inside out, so I know what I'm going to get. And with the advent of of uh, video assist, all the days when I was told by producers, even on Duelist and Alien, I shouldn't be operating because I need to keep my eye on the actors, of course, is absolute rubbish, because I never felt that was ever a problem anyway. And now every director sits usually 50 feet from the actor or actress watching a video of what's coming through the viewfinder, which is a very poor man's version of a viewfinder, actually, because when you're operating the camera, I am less than three or four feet from the actor, so I have a much more close communication. I always found that actors really liked the fact that all I've got to do is unblink my left eye and I can look straight them in the eye and talk to them. And so I've always thought that's a very logical process, and of course, after 25 years of doing it, now I can say that's the right thing to do and not the wrong thing to do, and I still believe that. So the first thoughts were always the best ones. So yes, it was a hard film for Slav, who for the most part was, uh, as he said, I'm used to small personal movies, and uh, this was large and I think not impersonal. At the end of the day, I think what comes down is a very personal movie, and you know, where I'm doing my best to reflect uh, what it's like for these guys to be in the field, that became, for me, the order of the day. That's what my story was. I wanted people to know what these guys do and what they, these guys do for a living for the most part on our behalf so I guess at the end of the day the film is anti-war which anyone in their right mind making a film about war I hope is going to be a serious film about war is going to be anti-war he's he can hardly be pro-war but oddly enough anti-war but this is pro-military it's pro what these individuals do in present circumstances today in this present world, in this present situation. Um, what they used to do before, was there an abuse of this process? Probably, uh, probably frequently. Are they less liable to be able to get away with that now abuse or atrocity? Yeah, you're probably far less liable to get away with that if, you, if your heart takes you in that direction or if you're, if you're as a soldier you react in a barbaric fashion, will it be reported? Probably it will. Um, so in this very politically correct and searching world, I support these guys to what they do, given the circumstances. And I know there'll be many people, you know, listening to that with um, raised eyebrows or rolling eyeballs, but um, I keep asking them when I was asked continually by, usually actually, press and foreign press saying, but do you approve of what happened here? And I said, uh, well, of course I do. Um, they said, but do you fundamentally approve of intervention? I said, of course I do. And they said, but why? There's got to be another way. And I said, well, there isn't another way. If these guys hadn't gone in, or if, if Bush hadn't gone in earlier, that's senior, gone in earlier with all those troops, this would have deteriorated way earlier. And just by Bush's intervention, temporarily or otherwise, probably stop the death of between two and 300,000 people. Um, when these guys then pull out, because the, 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 the government is embarrassed, they pull out immediately after this event, and 10 months later you get Rwanda. So what do you do about that? Well, any well-meaning journalist saying there must be another way. I said, well, there isn't another way, because if you don't do something, you're going to get a million, get hacked to pieces 10 months later. If we had an intervention somewhere like Rwanda, which isn't sophisticated on a weapons and military 
level, certainly at that moment, it was like a civil war with machetes, you know, maybe 2,000 troops could have stopped it all, right? And become the governing factor, become the sh temporary sheriffs. As long as that is maintained, you're maintaining order. Always the biggest question, the biggest problem is how long do we stay in? Uh, we can't stay forever, you know? Do we leave some of these communities to it, to fundamentally destroy each other? I think the answer is I don't think so. Even though there's many mistakes made, uh, we lose lives. We wonder why, as they keep saying, putting our children in foreign soil where, you know, for the most part, we couldn't even, you know, write its name on a, on a, on a map. Uh, we wouldn't know where it was. I think two things to be said about that is these guys are not children. They are men who actually volunteer for this process. It's their passion and it's their life. They know what the score is and they know what they're doing. And I think for the most part, a lot of them particularly have a sense of their own, you know, dedication to a process where they believe they are making a difference. However small they believe they're making a difference. And that's what I feel that the, these young kids went over there. They went over there and they're not politicians. They don't make policy, they enforce it. And when you use the military, it's the last resort. And what you have to understand, and I think some of the mistakes we made, is that when you go into a foreign country and you, you station your troops and you put them in harm's way, you have to prepare the public for um, body bags coming back. Uh, it's inevitable in, in the military that when you go on these dangerous missions, if we don't shoot each other or a helicopter doesn't go down, somebody will do it for you, and you're going to lose men. And, and if you're not prepared for it, then what happened with Clinton will happen again, where he, you go on a mission, it's dangerous, you accomplish the mission, and that's what the military did. They went in to get these top lieutenants from Indeed. They got those lieutenants, unfortunately got caught in a hellish firefight for 18 and a half hours, but did get those men out and brought to justice. Um, and, you know, two weeks later they, they were pulled out, and those men and everybody else was released. Uh, so the, the parents of these young soldiers uh, felt that their sons and and husbands had died in vain because it wasn't a serious enough mission to, to continue it. Production designer Arthur Max, who I've worked with on several occasions, notwithstanding Gladiator, then this Black Hawk Down, and way earlier G.I. Jane. Arthur's one of the great creative production designers who can handle big scale projects with two to three you know, art directors, and Arthur as production designer is boss over quite a large department. Um, in fact, probably the single most expensive factor in this movie was the art department in terms of what they were doing. When Arthur and I entered Saleh, which is, to remind you, is just a suburb of Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco, is the financial capital of Morocco, um, we saw the gnarly working-class district, which was a great, you know, version of Mogadishu, and said, OK, let's go, let's walk through the streets. So we walked the streets, notched the street corners, notched the crossroads, and then found a, literally a dirt, dirt football field. Nothing on it but two posts and dirt. And it's there we decided to build the Moorish target building because one thing I didn't have in the street was an important enough building to make it look like a town hall where the infrastructure were meeting. So we created that because then we could actually do what we wanted. We could shoot the building up, we could land on the roof, etc., etc. But um, other than that, Arthur went around on the areas on the streets, making them even more East African, adding arches and Moorish arches where we didn't have them, adding some Moorish arcades to the street because the, these streets that I was shooting in were probably actually, in fact, no older than the 50s although the original foundations probably were way earlier. It was a tricky film because I was on a fast track. I'd finished Hannibal, I was putting Hannibal out on February the 14th. Uh, but shortly after Christmas, I was kind of doing my, you know, selling process and journey, traveling with Hannibal, talking to journalists, etc., etc. At the same time, we were casting this film, um, Black Hawk, and I was due to go in to Mogadishu actually less than a month before the start of principal photography. But because 
I think of good organization because I can read, I was a designer, so I can read elevations, I can then contribute on an elevation, an architectural drawing, and make marks and notation as to what's this, what that, I think this is too small, I think that's too large. So best part of my brain is the visual side where I, I'm already seeing what I'm going to get before it's up. And that does enable me to plan at a distance, particularly with someone like Arthur Max, who's a good friend and was is a very good architect and, and also a great designer. Terry Needham's a great organizer, planner uh, with Branko Lustig. Uh, Branko was the line producer. Those are really the three cornerstones of my setup before the other unit really starts to come because at this moment you've got months before finding these, this, say this building site, which is the, the we call it the Alamo. This is a building site that was with all those upright concrete structures with had never been finished. So it was I was starting with a, like a two million dollar start. They just run out of money and moved out. So my permission was saying, I need the crossroads. There's no blacktop, it's all dirt. So it really looks like the real thing. It's incredibly gnarly. And it was great, it was like having a giant building site all to myself. Those RPGs became my favorite toy. Um, I shouldn't really call a weapon a toy, but it was a toy. Um, I think Austin Wells said it's the best train set a boy could ever have, which was the process of making movies. And of course here, without question, I get to play soldier and general and literally um, reconstruct the Battle of Mogadishu. And, you know, during that process, it's my job to gradually put myself into the position. And therefore, when you're on the street under tremendously heavy fire, with all the magazines belching brass and, and uh, the only thing missing are the actual missiles, it's entirely real. You are actually part of a battle. And therefore, the planning process becomes really stringent. But the RPG, which you're about to see, is basically a rocket-propelled grenade launcher with a lethal little rocket in it, which has got a grenade in its nose, which is coming up now, nearly. Um, this one, that's an RPG. Um, that actually is on a wire. And I just stuck this piece of wire, which is stretched tight with this rocket sliding along it, which is triggered by a radio control. So the guy standing there, he's not doing it. He's just looking like he's firing from the rocket. And then later the CGI puts in the back firing, which is the exhaust. And a lot of those things in the, in the film were done that way. This was extraordinary in the sense of, it, it was in the book, both these events were in the book. He was the guy who did the paintings and was writing the children's book. That's all, that's not cute, that's real. He was a good illustrator, he was trying to complete the last act of the children's book that he hoped to have published. His ambition when he got back to the United States was to have a bookstore in his home state, which I think was Massachusetts. And this was never to happen because this was his last day Ironically, he actually lasted for another two and a half hours. At the same time, a man saw the hand on the ground and, and knew it was army by definition of the wristwatch. And Corporal, who picked it up, his name was Corporal Hand. So that's very strange. Maybe he was predestined to always do that in his life, is to pick up this hand on the battlefield and he, the only thing you could think of was to pick it up and put it in the bag and hope that it could be grafted back on and go back to the hospital. So there was a kind of crazy logic to it. So if viewers think this is extreme, it is extreme, warfare is extreme, and that's exactly what I was trying to illustrate. This is what these guys do.
These two represent a kind of uh, almost comic relief, or certainly a relief, you know, that they are literally forgotten about. In the heat of the moment, they were meant to get picked up by the trucks. Instead, they take a trucks take a right hand turning earlier than where they are, and therefore they now believe that they're going to be cut off. So their little journey became a very useful one because it was about the only part where we could take a little bit of time out during the movie for a little bit of humor. But uh, these two guys worked out absolutely great. Of course, you and Bremner does become deaf. Um, uh, because what do you do? You fire a gun or save a guy's eardrums. Um, you got to fire a gun. And uh, he became very hard of hearing. I think he recovered, though. But when you're that close to the muzzle of a gun, it can literally blow your e eardrums. This is the second chopper to get hit here, it was uh, Goffina, went in under tremendous fire, dropped the medic, and he had to hold position and get shot at while the guys go to the ground and get into the crashed helicopter. Then he is told to get out of there because he's got smoke coming from the top of his rotor, and he does, he has to leave. I added the fact that I wanted to put him under tremendous pressure and by now the RPG was uh, definitely one of my swiftest and most available piece of threatening weaponry. So we rigged this to say, does he have enough time to uh, turn the chopper, bring to bear the gun? Because that mini gun, which is very efficient Gatling, only has just over a 90 degree sweep. So beyond that sweep, you've got to then turn the chopper. Otherwise you can't get it, you can't get your target. And that's what that was about. But in the process of firing the Gatling, I thought it'd be great if the Somalian had just fired the rocket so it nearly gets the man on the ground, nearly blows up the, uh, the helicopter. Both pilots are dead. Two five. We can't move these guys, Manny. We'll kill them just carrying them. Stabilize in here. Roger. Stabilize in the burn. Repeat, stabilize in here, over. At this point in the story, they're beginning to realize that um, this isn't going to be anything like the plan they thought it was going to be. Already, they're getting behind, and already, they're anticipating problems. And uh, here's Durant going in to actually take over in that position of where Gafina was meant to be, because he got hit. And the unthinkable, they get hit twice. Now, you know, these rockets are pretty simple to, to um, fire. And I believe they're um, accurate up to 100 meters. So that's scarily accurate, because if you're on the ground, that chopper's up there, you know, 300 feet, you just got to point it. If you hit it anywhere on the chopper, the chances are you're going to damage the rotors. Once you damage the rotors, the chopper's out of control. And that tail rotor, is a real target because if you hit that spindle or a blade and crack it with a rifle bullet, you're in trouble. You've got to get out of there and get down the ground as fast as possible. Besides, it doesn't take a genius to fire an RPG, right? I could trinity hunt use an RPG in about half an hour. Well, you've got an aiming device, a sight, and you pull the trigger. And the, the trick is to make sure you've got nobody standing behind you because the exhaust would literally kill them, right? You know, when you're doing a film like this, this is, uh, you know, you're halfway in of a 16-week impossible schedule. This film normally would be mm, 25 weeks, right? But I don't like taking my time like that. I think it, it's endless. It draws itself out. I like to be under pressure. 16 weeks for this was fine for me. And, um, but it means you can't, you can't mess about. You have to get on with it. You've got to make decisions fast. You've got to let people do things. Um, you know, which is uh, all down to a good team, reliable team. If you haven't got a reliable team, you'll end up redoing things, and that's when it gets expensive. So Ruiz, who was worried about being hit on this particular day, was. That's all true. Um, at the end of it all, 
I think Ruiz died um, uh, because he lost so much blood. Again, this is one of those apartment buildings nearly finished, but still, look at that. That's, that's not bombed out building, that's half stages of getting it built. And they just walk away from it when they run out of money. Oh, Slav's shot there was great. Slav was on that camera and when the, the RPG went off and exploded, he panned to the guy but while he panned at the guy, he saw the rifle standing on end, which started to fall over, and so it was a great shot where he managed to include the rifle falling as well. He was very happy about that. So we have a perpetuation here of the, uh, the unpopular Mr. Steele going by the book, saying, I'm not moving on. I've got so many wounded and potential dead that I'm going to set up hospital here and the convoy can come pick us up later. So he's already kind of got into a delaying factor, not exactly giving up, because they have the two prisoners. So they got that. They've now got to get picked up, right? And it's going to get worse. You're going to go into the night, and the night is going to be hell. This was uh, Durant crash, where at first there was no one moving down there. Durant, they believe, was dead but there's no way he could communicate to the Black Hawk above. So we know that um, Durant is now isolated down there and they will not risk another chopper going in because if they do, he could lose one more chopper and lose guys. Um, even though Shugart and Gordon, who are Delta, asked to go in three times before garrison says to them you know what you're asking and that i won't be able to guarantee that i will have ground forces going there within 45 minutes so there will be no guarantee as to their chances and nevertheless even despite that conversation shugart and gordon still requested to be put down there and they were and they died and um because of that that was obviously considered as uh, you know above and beyond the call of duty and therefore their valor was rewarded by Congressional Medals of Honor. And they were the highest decorated troops since Vietnam. And their names were put on the front each of two American frigates. So that was, they were really honored, but it was an expensive price to pay. Later on with Slavomir, who thought that we would have at least two weeks of pickups at the end of this, um, I said, no, we haven't. We'll ha we have it. We have the movie because I felt I was so covered in many different ways. I knew somewhere in here we had it. Even though the way it was shot was pretty frenetic and frantic, I still believe in classical positions for classical cameras. And, you know, even though they're handheld or they're wobbly camera or they're 45 degree angle shutters or whatever we're doing with them at that moment, I'm covering, covering, covering. It's all about coverage. Because then if I'm supplying Pietro with coverage, then whilst it may drive him crazy, there's nothing worse than being undercovered. And I knew I was fully covered. So I took a bet in the last day saying, for a minute, I'll bet you a thousand bucks, mate, we're not back here and we weren't. We, we had it all. The only things I picked up way down the line were, I think there's like four days shooting where we put together close-ups of monitor screens and and one little clarification to show that there was a friendly zone and a hostile zone in Mogadishu. Other than that, we had the whole thing, which, considering the complexity of the piece, was not a miracle, it's just professionalism, you know? People say, my God, it, was, it wasn't a miracle. It was, we knew what we were doing. There's no luck in this process. You have to know what you're doing. You have to predetermine where you're going and you have to pre-plan and you have to allow for Murphy's Law. It will happen at least 12 times an hour every day. <laughs> and if you don't plan for that, then you're, you're again, like a military operation, then you're a fool. Uh, also, a lot of it is about predetermining the likelihood of something that might go wrong, and therefore you avoid it. The, the thing is about avoiding problems. The donkey was my homage to Victoria de Sica, 
And uh, I thought, what a perfect situation to bring these two characters back together, that somewhere mysteriously the donkey has just taken off or the driver got shot. So the donkey is just basically going home. So the, this little donkey has its own little story to tell. It's ironic because it brings the three soldiers back together who, in, in the process of doing that, they nearly shoot each other, which must happen often. Friendly fire, they reckon, was as high as 40% in Vietnam. You know, not knowing who is who and just letting fly in the dark or around a corner or worse, in a jungle, in foliage. God, with nothing to stop it. So a movement with a trigger-happy soldier is enough to bring a whole platoon down, right? But again, perpetuating the very amusing three characters. Um, but also the reality check where he... Uh, does his report and they're asking where the heck is the crash site and they, of course they don't know. This project was first brought to us by um, an agent who represented Simon West who we just finished Con Air with. And Simon wanted to work at our company again and found this piece of material through his agent and packaged Simon in the project. Um, we started developing the project. Uh, we hired a writer that we've been, been after for a number of years, Ken Nolan, who's a very young screenwriter in Hollywood. And he worked um, a couple of years on various versions of the movie. We tried every possible combination of characters. And every time we read the script, we found that we still had too many characters because the book is so rich, you hate to cut things out. Uh, so we finally got to a place where we felt we had something that um, was coherent, exciting, even though we knew it wasn't finished, we knew it was at a place where we could involve another creative mind because we'd been working on this sort of thing for over three years. And uh, we brought uh, Ian Ridley. He's just a consummate filmmaker. He's one of the greatest directors, um, living and dead. You know, he's going to go down in history as, as with the greats, with the David Leans and, and the John Fords and all the great directors you know, around the world. So you always want to work with the best, and he's the best. And unfortunately, in my career, the timing just doesn't quite work uh, to always get the greatest directors to work with you. So you have to bring up new directors, and we've been very successful as a company bringing up young kids and, and showing how talented they can be. But it's always great to work with the, with the masters, and he's the master. We've been friends for years. We did a commercial together 30 years ago in San Francisco for B.F. Goodrich, and I'd worked with his brother four or five times and always wanted to work with Ridley Unfortunately, whenever we had a project that was ready to go, he was off somewhere in the world shooting another movie. So the timing never quite worked out. Uh, I had lunch with him, and I told him about this book we bought and sent him the book. And about a couple months later, uh, the screenplay finally came in that we were comfortable with and sent it over to him. And he said, look, I'll do it. And uh, we were in business. Ridley was in the process of still finishing Hannibal, so he was in um, editing and doing post-production on it, doing the music and and uh, sound, and uh, so his time was split a little bit. October, it was 2001 last year, October 2000, I'm editing and mixing Hannibal. Jerry comes to me saying, I have this book you should look at. I think this is for you. And of course it was. Jerry Bruckheimer, who's been a friend of mine for a long time, 25 years, actually. We've worked together once before. Was I did a commercial with Jerry when I was a commercial director and Jerry was a producer at an advertising agency. And um, the commercial went fine. And at the end of the shoot, we were, I think we were either driving to the airport or coming away from the location. And uh, Jerry informed me that he was actually going to leave the business. And I said, oh, yeah, doing what? And uh, he said, I'm going to make feature films. And I th always thought, yeah, sure. You know, because in those days to get into feature films was really difficult, and particularly from television commercials where we were only regarded as doing short form, and therefore it was impossible. Now, of course, commercials and rock videos tend to be the main source of talent, directing talent. So, 25 years later, Jerry comes to me saying, I have this script and this book you should look at. I think this is for you. And, of course, the whole process was very nice and great fun, and um, really, I... Uh, very adventurous and challenging project to do. So I'm glad it was with him. It was it was great. I'll do it again in a flash. Here again, the request to go in. Garrison was basically saying, put him on. Uh, and basically saying, do you realize what you're asking for? In other words, he is saying the chances of me coming back to help you 
are unlikely any time in the next foreseeable future. So you're going in to defend a position, but you're putting yourself in danger. They say they understand. That black Labrador that runs across the shot did it four times on four takes. So I can only think he either wants to get into movies or he had a death wish. But it was an old Labrador that every time I called action, he'd gone to that side of the street and he would run across the street. <laughs> Moroccan Labrador. I think the guy falling out of the truck there wasn't meant to do that. He wasn't paying attention. I think he must have been leaning on the door. And as it turned in, the door flew open and he took a header out the door. That was the reason I used the take, because it was so funny. I thought he, was, well, he wasn't paying attention. This is all true. He took an RPG through the door of the truck, which didn't explode it, went through his ribcage and, of course, killing him instantly, blew his arm off, killed him in instantly, and that was the end of him. The book was um, clearly the thing that got me on board because I hadn't actually been down the route before of what could come under the heading of, uh, you know, current affairs. I mean, current in the sense that this was nine years old, but it still was very relevant today. And, of course, that proved to be totally right with September and that occurrence. And now we are exactly where these guys were in Mogadishu. We're now in the same position in, in Afghanistan and other places rapidly opening up so it was very much with a view to illuminating just what these guys do for a living which i thought was very interesting and uh because uh you know there was a political preamble to all of this which you can explore in the book and you because you know you've got you've got somebody who's reading a book which may be three four hundred pages but they can put it up and you know, pick it up and put it down films you've got to somehow distill that into the two hours or the 223 that this was and i'd better be accurate but brief about the reason why because the film would really be about how does half an hour deteriorate into 18 and a half hours of really hideous behavior right and that process to me was what was really fascinating and that process very much led me down the path of thinking, well, let's not come up with answers. You know, let's only just come up with as it, and see it as it was, as it happened. And therefore, there'll be lots of questions, and that's good. Because right? questions create discussion, and discussion usually creates, uh, you know, illuminates things and uh, clarifies things, or at least makes you think about it, which is... Uh, enough, really. I was very proud of this insertion and uh, getting into the back of the wash house. They crashed into the wash house, getting him out of there, and then dealing with his, dealing with their demise and his. They were very fast running out of ammunition. In the back of the wash house, Durant assumes that the, the convoy is on its way. And he actually said, uh, where's the rescue squad? And uh, Shugart all gone and said, we're it. So Durant had to then be part of the team and defend his own position. We're right back where we started. I'm running low on ammo. I've got many wounded, including me. Vehicles that are barely running. Okay, Danny, I need a no BS assessment here. Can you get to the... Crib? All these helicopter shots, which were all predestined to actually do as blue screen, I just couldn't face blue screen because I, I, I don't favor blue screen, particularly in something which is so realistic. And um, so in frustration, I got Alex Witt, my second unit director, in there with the sheafs of pages of what... These actors are going to have to say to each other during the process of the hours in the air. And I figured, you know, this is where you get to a pragmatic point on very large movies particularly. This is where it's called being totally pragmatic. And if you don't, you can get buried alive in a film like this. Um, I said to Alex, you know what, go up. Here's the pages. I'll talk to the guys, talk to the actors about it. And I said, I want a, two wide shots from left and right and two close-ups from left and right, if you get 60% of it, 
I'm 60% better off on the day than having to go out, shoot them acting against blue screen, and then put in the blue screen, which is always a nightmare, right? And in fact, ironically, everything he shot, I used. So I didn't have to do any blue screen. So it's all to do with, you know, your image and view of what you want. And I don't mind if a face is a silhouette against a black exterior, because that's what you'd see. And people get terribly hooked on the fire. I must see the landscape behind it. But I don't think it matters because, particularly in this kind of movie, right? And you still see enough. See where you are. We interviewed a number of the, of the rangers and, and um, other personnel that were over in Somalia during the battle. Um, and some of them were actually working for us. One was a stuntman. Uh, and helped us out, um, and then we had the two uh, advisors who were with us, and, and also we, we brought over Matt Eversman at a certain point, and he arrives on the set, and um, the driver pulls him up to a huge, like, semi-small hill, and he walks up to the top of the hill, and the other side of the hill is, is uh, our set, and it just scared him to death. He thought he was right back in Mogadishu all over again. It was real deja vu for him. It kind of took his breath away and said the color drained from his face when he saw what was going on in the streets because it looked so real. Um, and that's another thing that's really amazing about the movie is the fact that the military uh, or the military personnel who have seen the picture say this is the, one of the best war movies or the best war movie that they've ever seen because it, it really gets it right. We've got so many letters from soldiers and parents around the world who have um, had either their kids involved in Somalia or just fans uh, of the movie and, and talking about the accuracy. And I think three of the most scary screenings that I went to with Ridley were when we took the film to the various military bases. We took it to Fort Bragg, Fort Benning, and Fort Campbell, uh, where the various men uh, were trained in, for Somalia, and some of them are still uh, posted there. And, and um, we had a whole group had just come back from Afghanistan fighting over there. And we showed them the movie, and they came up and thanked us uh, with tears in their eyes for making the picture and for, uh, I guess, the attention to detail uh, that Ridley put into the picture. So the fact that 200 of them lined up uh, after the screening just to shake our hands and thank us uh, felt great. We went to another fort, and this was where the surviving parents or spouses or children of the men who died over there. And that was a very tough screening because uh, there were a lot of tears, a lot of handkerchiefs in the audience. And uh, one of the wives came up to me afterwards, and uh, her husband had died over there, and, and just w with tears in her eyes hugged me and said, God, thank you so much for making this film. My husband will never be forgotten. Um, another woman who was really skeptical about us making the movie, and very upset about it before she went into the screening and was angry, uh, came out and said, I'm, I'm really happy you made the film. You know, I changed my mind. Um, you know, my husband, you know, now will go down in history as somebody who tried to, to do the right thing. I would say 90% of the critics were very much in favor of the movie and gave it rave reviews. And we're talking about Schickler, we're talking about uh, Time Magazine, we're talking about Travis at Rolling Stone. You know, the list goes on and on of, of major critics, the two television critics, uh, Ebert and Roper, who were also fans of the movie. So we had a uh, a real strong following for the film. Of course, you always have your detractors, you know. I think it was one, the New York Times was one of them. And I don't know what movie he saw, I really don't, because his comments really, I felt, weren't valid for this particular movie. And, and you know, when you have comments, what about the other side, what about the Somali people? You know, you always, from a movie, you try to tell it from a point of view, not every point of view. It's not a documentary on the subject. Uh, Mark um, certainly got had some things in his book about the Somalis, but you have to focus on your characters and your lead characters, and they weren't going to be the Somalis. And we give you a real sense of how they felt about the Americans from two very powerful scenes with them, that they're very intelligent, um, they have a purpose, they know what they're doing, and um, they're not going to let us interfere. So you got that point of view. Um, you know, and we felt that we covered that very well. Now, Durant never figured whether he was saved for humanitarian reasons by Firimbi, or whether he was saved because he might be a useful negotiating tool. And I, th I think probably the latter is the most relevant because they took him on a cot and kept him on that cot for 11 days. His femur was snapped and the bone was sticking through his trousers and through the cloth of the trousers. 
and therefore he was convinced he was going to get gangrene, lose his leg first and then his life, because no one did anything about it. They just didn't touch it, and uh, which is pretty brutal. But then, of course, they probably thought we were brutal, you know. But it's not exactly a good way of looking after somebody who may be valuable later. Uh, there was this discussion with Ferenbi as to whether or not you should take him in the hospital, and it was decided not to take him in the hospital, which would have been very imprudent, because Durant would have probably been torn apart. Roger that. Kalo 64, this is Kalo 11. Request permission to move to crash site number two on foot. Over. Green light. Kalo 11. Green light. Stop the vehicle. We're now heading towards the evening. And um, this again is true as Hoot, or the gentleman that's called Hoot, is Eric Barner. Uh, Hoot's real name we didn't use because Hoot requested that we didn't use his real name. I didn't want any information about himself revealed whatsoever. And uh, at the moment, he, I think, is in Afghanistan doing his own special kind of work. Whether, quite what he's up to, I don't you know. So the convoy can't get directly to the crash site. So Hoot figures it better to go on foot and get in there. Otherwise, he's going to be too late for everything. And in fact, that's what they did with the damaged size more who still had his plaster cast on. So this is where you start to get things kicking in which are above and beyond the call of duty. None of these guys had to do this. Once they go back in the base and they're wounded or, you know, exhausted, they don't have to come back out. Every one of them came back out. Nobody swung the lead. Committed. Now you have the formation come together, what we now call the Alamo, which they favored the word Alamo because that's what it was. They were held there all night. They now know, they've got a pretty good idea that there will be no going home this evening. And they know they have limited supplies of medical, limited IVs, and you can only replace blood to a certain extent with the IV before the entire body is running on IV. And, you know, once that's happening, then you're going to die. Um, because also once the heart doesn't have enough blood to function on, the pump simply gives out because there's nothing to work on it, right? So the situation was very scary for all of them, and particularly for those who were the wounded. In the helicopter, there's two medics working on the pilots and the one of the deltas who was still alive from the crash. People don't really mention or talk about medics so much, you know, and that's why I wanted the sequence that's about to happen where we have uh, Corporal Smith is uh, hit in the leg, just in the groin, by a bullet. And um, Doc Schmidt, who is the medic, has to do this operation, which I was told was the equivalent of like trying to do open heart surgery on a kitchen table with no equipment or backup or anesthetic or oxygen, nothing. You're going to Put your hand in the wound, you're going to try and grab the femoral artery. If you don't, his whole lifeblood is just going to run out, which is unfortunate what happened. But people say, why that sequence? And I said, well, why not? This is what happens. This is what happened, and I had a medic standing right by me, advising me on every move. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show what happens when this occurs. And I, people are odd because... You know, they'll sit and watch a birth on PBS or brain surgery on PBS. What's the difference, right? Uh, and here we're showing what these guys do. That's what this film's about. I see him. Let's move out. Can you cover us, Sergeant? We got you. Nelson. They misjudged the time of the uh, prayer, which is the evening prayer, like our even song. The prayer ended and he got shot. The guy whose bag goes up, he's got what we call the stun grenades in, which are phosphorus, 
because what you do is you lob them into a room, they go off with a stunning bang and blinding white light, and that's why they call a stun grenade, because that will give you moments to go in and do whatever you have to do before you have people recover in the room. All of this stuff was built and production designed by Arthur. All this interior was made up. An old dentist waiting room, which oddly enough did exist. Uh, and we thought that was a good idea, so let's, you know, expand on that. The outside had been uh, hairdressers and different shops, low-level shops. And they'd come in to actually try and, uh, you know, make something better in this particular area as a building site and they just stop, they just run out of money. But you know, when you're living in communities like this, you get used to it and you get used to the order of the day and the used to how people live. So when you come back home or you come to, particularly Hollywood or Beverly Hills, it's a real culture shock. You, Cause you get used to the process of going home at night through hundreds and hundreds of Muslims walking all over the road, you know, there's no real order or traffic order. Um, kids going home from school. Um, it's a huge Muslim society. And it's fine. It's a community. And in fact, in the Saleh district, I felt a tremendous sense of community, house to house, kids, kids roaming in bands, five, six, seven-year-old kids, all roaming in bands, looking after each other, you know, and all curious, all grinning, and all... Great. I mean, it was really, really a pleasant experience. Although it would look at us with great curiosity, as if we'd come from outer space. So that's where they call in, because Doc Smith knows that his femoral artery is absolutely shot. He's got to get him out of there. And he's going to have limited IV. Funny if this part of the set was part of the Medina. This wasn't the set, this was the Medina where we start the film off when we first see Eric Bana watching Asmanato coming out of the cafe before he gets arrested. So this is how you use two sets in one. You just remove the dressing and you got this great you know, rather ominous remains of a marketplace. The chopper, the crash chopper, I saw enough times on photographs to realize that it became a bit of an icon, became a bit of a symbol. And therefore, you know, it's, of course, the symbol of American potency, American dominance, and, uh, you know, the unbeatable. Um, and there it is sitting on the ground where already kids are starting to play games on it like a climbing frame. And that's why Hoot, who came along that twilight and said, already they were playing on it. They were tearing it apart with whatever they had, pliers, and of course those things are actually incredibly strong. And so they were trying to tear it apart and take pieces away, and that's why he cleared the area and he blew up the chopper because he, you know, there was classified equipment on board, which I doubt would be any use to these people, but they didn't want anything to survive. And, and basically it's a phosphorus bomb, which burns through into the petrol tank and then takes it up. Here we have Garrison saying, basically we gotta get them out of there, otherwise I'm gonna have a hundred body bags in the morning. And this is, we also have the tricky side of the, of the discussion, which was basically the 10th mountain and the UN commanders were really irritated that they hadn't been told that this was happening. And uh, now they were being asked to go out into a community which was already enraged. And uh, so they were less than happy about that. And uh, except Garrison had kept it to himself because he felt it was necessary to keep to himself. Uh, because there's always a way of leaking. There's always a leak. The more people know, you're gonna have a leak, right? I think, I think Garrison felt very vulnerable about the very risky, uh, unreliable 
uh, intelligence. Uh, no one was reliable because you've got to take guys who are on the ground in Mogadishu. You can't take an American saying, go learn Mogadishu, come back in three months and we're going to put you into Mogadishu. He'd last a day. So you're going to have to go for the real thing on the ground. And uh, that's hard. How reliable are they? You know? This actor, for me, he's from London, or North London. In Somalia, killing is negotiation. Do you really think... Now, what's interesting, using sets, this whole set is the actual entrance of the town hall. So rather than going to find another location, why don't we just put in windows or, or grills in the doorway where Tom Sizemore was standing, and you light it from the ground, you've got another place. So, cost of the grills, I didn't have to move the unit. This is a true. The helicopter's saying, Durant, we're not going to leave you behind, we will not leave you behind. And they broadcast that by flying over Mogadishu with loudspeakers. Got to take over, Farmer. Both hands. And then we have Doc Smith requesting that, uh, he's warning him actually, warning him it's gonna be heavy and says, I need your help. And uh, it's pretty well what they did. They held him on a table and went for the artery. And then he thought they had it and he said, did you get it? And I guess, you know, uh, Josh's. Josh says, um, there's no future in saying, no, we didn't get it. So he just says, yes, we got it. But they know he's going to die. All right, you understand? Right now, he's half full of, you know, the saline solution, really. I'm sorry. You're Twombly, why don't you take his hands there? And they couldn't give him morphine, so he's in bloody agony. Um, because the morphine slowed down his heart pound. Keep pressure on the top of the leg. Blood count. You're, you're going to take the feet and the flashlight on my count. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that... When I went to one of the bases to run the film, I ran the film in three bases, military bases, for really showing them what we'd done in their approval, of which we really got fairly, actually, in fact, unanimous approval from both Delta and from uh, Special Forces Rangers. Um, I met some parents, and I met the parents of Smith. And... Uh, I warned the mum and the dad. I took the dad on one side. Look, he said, look, the sequence in here is, is as accurate as I can make it. I want you to be aware of that. So what you're about to see at a certain point in the movie is going to be very distressing, um, particularly for your wife or for you. So I'm, I have to warn you of that. And uh, they said, nope, they wanted to see it. And uh, they did. And at the end of it, they were very relieved that they'd seen the whole movie. Um... Because they said, you know, at the end of it, when they were withdrawn so quickly, we felt that we'd lost our son for nothing. And uh, we wanted to see what he did and how he behaved and how he, you know, that it, what he did, to a certain extent, they wanted to feel that it was worthwhile. And therefore, it hadn't been wasted. You know, but at the end of the day, is always the question about any engagement, about any war. Uh, you know, is it ever worthwhile? Giving Ewan a through line, I mean, I just came up with coffee, and because I'm a coffee fanatic, and so I know that coffee is buying. It's funny how life works. I once sat down with Harrison Ford when I first met him when I was doing Blade Runner, and Harrison was making, I was sitting in his kitchen, and I'll never forget, he was showing me how to make coffee. And uh, he was saying it's all in the measure, it's all, it's absolute. You can't fake it, don't guess. It's the measure of coffee against the measure of water. And that always sank in, and I always followed that advice. So I can actually make, you know, decent coffee. And I thought, why not make the guy from the office has the same obsession? Because actually, there's nothing else for him to do except type the stuff up, you know, read a couple of novellas or Playboy magazine, and make coffee and smoke cigarettes. And I just thought that was amusing to carry it as a through line. Of course, in a place that used to be a ratty old hotel here, he found some old 
maybe Rhodesian coffee and uh, used some of his flask water and made himself a coffee. Ewan McGregor's character was Grimes, um, who of course was the man who was in the front office, although trained originally as a ranger, had gradually through Gulf War and other actions never ventured outside the office and therefore he'd become part of his, you know, makeup that he thought that uh, he would think how exciting it would be to go outside and test himself, but he was never asked to go. So gradually he got used to the process of not going so that finally when he was asked to fill in on this particular day, the irony was he became like a catalyst for bullets and RPGs, houses falling on him, walls falling on him, and yet he survived the whole process. Like any beginner, you got beginner's luck involved. This is a Russian recoilless rifle, which is a pretty giant millimeter shell. It's ironically called a rifle, but it's a gun that has to be mounted on a vehicle and uh, is quite lethal. Arthur built all the Moorish stuff you see and he put in the whole old city gate. We figured that we need to make it look more, you know, kind of the remains of the ancient part of Africa. So we put in the big old um, Moorish gate, which really paid off very well. That gate, that was all put in by Arthur. So we had plenty of practice on that because of Gladiator. I always thought that at this moment we were a bit under scheduled for the night shooting. Night shooting is really tricky. And I always thought it was slightly under, under conceived. And the danger for me here always was the fact that, you know, it, whatever you do, you're starting to look like action heroes, right? And um, so, but the guys did it so well, I think it actually worked out very well. You know? And, but I was very, quite nervous about this. This is one of the areas that wasn't really particularly well planned so it was all and mainly because it was just about action but i think eric dealt with it really well they all they all did it really well in fact eric's the favorite shot in the movie is when he's standing there by that recallless rifle and that he and the sunglasses eyeball each other and he just does the pulls the trigger which fundamentally means that we're all essentially bloodthirsty really we don't hold back this city here we are at the uh Late evening, and uh, he wants all the ground forces to go in there because he thinks he's going to lose everyone. He's revealed to the UN and to the 10th Mountain that uh, they need the help, and here they are. Between 10th Mountain and the UN, we've got enough personnel, okay? Danny, you guys do not have to go back out again. We built this gate and the wall here. It was a, a ratty old soccer stadium which had never been finished, again, part of the process of building in Morocco. And so we decided it was perfect for us being the, the uh, what they call the Pakistani Olympic Stadium in Mogadishu. It was really on the edge of a safe zone and also, of course, it was defensible. You saved Twombly. You did perfect. Yeah. You okay, Twombs? So now, in story terms, um, there's probably a view from the audience, and you have to think about these things when you're constructing script, that maybe or maybe not there is some kind of hope mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, convoy reaching them and thereby taking Smithy away with them and saving his life. But I never really tried to go for that because I thought it was invalid and I thought it was kind of... Again, very traditional, structural, would they, will they, won't they. I didn't want to do that with this movie. I just wanted to show it as it was. Um, so that's why I don't, deliberately don't crank up the possibilities of the will they, won't they get there in time, which is very traditional. And, you know, that's why people in this film say, well, they haven't got many backstories. I said, what's the relevance of backstories and side stories? The only thing that's relevant is the experience. So I absolutely stand my ground on that one. And uh, I know the more discerning and harder 
you know, knows individuals about story and structure are very supportive of the film, particularly from that direction, that there's no, you know, milking the characters. The characters are part of the process. The process was meant to take half an hour and ended up taking 18 and a half hours. That is the story. We're not doing a, a you know, anything but the target being a, a you know, really a, a war incident that um, was very much acknowledged as very much part of American military history uh, um, as one of the most important parts of the last, uh, really, 40 years. This is the longest ground offensive since Vietnam because normally these skirmishes which are on the ground, street fighting can be 45 seconds or three minutes. This lasted 18 and a half hours, never really stopped. So it was like these boys were almost thrown back into blitzkrieg of... Um, Second World War. Okay. I needed the voice of the movie, and um, it should come in two forms. This was never predetermined. This was gradually distilled while I was making the film, gradually realizing I had no voice and the voice should be a mature one and the voice of experience. So the scenes with Eric Barner were gradually put together during the process of making the movie. And um, the advice was always uh, philosophical um, and the, the undercurrent of cynicism is being cynical um, as to the reason why they're really there doing a job was always present, and I think that's why he says, uh, you know, once a bullet goes past your ear, all the politics and that shit goes out the window, and it's all about the guy next to you. And he gives them this, I think, very good pep talk here, saying, you know, you've done okay so far. You've just lost somebody, but your job right now is to get the rest of you live men back home safe, and that's your job. That is war now for you at this moment. And, um, and in a sense, you know, assisting by metaphorically pulling Eversman together. You got your man this far. Good advice. You did it right today. And the last exchange, of course, will be when we get to the stadium, which we'll deal with when we get there. Well. So now we have the um, full onslaught of. Uh, they're bringing to bear the little birds the who do this. They fly by night. Uh, they're called night stalkers. Their motto is, ironically, night stalkers don't quit. Um, and they fly and try and keep their eyes open for protruding objects, wires, cables. Uh, but it's a pretty hair-raising job, and these are pilots are the best in the business, I think. And uh, these, these aircraft aren't CGI that you see right here. That's real. That's at night, and that's real. So the same goes for my helicopter pilots, who actually film helicopter pilots. They did a pretty good job as well. The uh, you know the green the green uh, pictures, of course, are night vision, which are essential in helicopter flying. You do all all by night vision, and Delta and Rangers normally on the ground now at this time of the night would ha all have these uh, night vision goggles, which are actually quite valuable. And it's it was startling what you can see in real darkness. The problem about movie making is you've got to dramatize darkness to the point that, of course, the audience have to see. Otherwise, there's, n there's no point in watching the movie. You'll be watching radio. And so we have to cheat and um, do what we call movie darkness. Shooting at night is never my favorite time because I think... First of all, it's exhausting. And once you get past 12.30 in, at night, where it's usually dinner break, so everybody has dinner, and then filled with dinner at 1.30 in the morning, you really get only 40% out of everybody who are fading away and dying on their feet. And so it's economically and creatively a bad solution, whichever way you look at it. So what we did on this is split nights where we'd only work up to 12 o'clock at night. 
and then we could start later again, 12 hour turnaround, so you could start 12 o'clock the next day. Right? So you gradually work your way through the night, as opposed to investing your entire time from 6 at night to 6 in the morning, which is absolutely a killer. Again, where am I? You know, where am I? Oh, am I at the at the uh, me in the Alamo? No, I'm not. I'm with Captain Steele. All these characters, hopefully by now, are getting recognised. Also, apart from anything else, they're he helping me geographically understand where everyone is, because that was one of the hardest things to discern. Choose locations that look entirely different. But the problem is, once you get at night in a certain kind of location, you it all starts to look the same, right? The montage or passing of time, where I suddenly realized the coming of the trucks is not a large event because it will be a false event. It will not be their saving. It will be a perpetuation of the disaster. And therefore, I shouldn't spend too much importance or laying too much importance creatively on the arrival of a convoy that were basically arriving about the speed that a foot soldier could jog, because they had the 10th mountain running alongside the vehicles, can you believe? And uh, therefore, it's purely seeing as best they can be efficient is their efficiency at getting everyone out. Of course, they wouldn't leave. The whole point is that they would not leave until they had extricated the body of Walcott. And then what follows is the real ending or the real final solution, uh, which wasn't a solution, it was a mile run. Walcott's body uh, was, as far as they were concerned, on the, under the creed of leave no man behind. That's their creed. Um, it's not a piece of Hollywood screenwriting. Uh, it's a creed that uh, really, in a funny kind of way, is part of the... It could be almost written in Latin. It's so stringent and so fervently believed in and maintained. And um, they would not leave until they got out... Uh, Walcott. And yet people still say, well, what's the point of that? You're risking guys who are alive with a body. And um, I'm saying, I, I can't explain it. it. It is what it is. And that's what it is, and that's what they do. Even though at this point, Grimes was freaking out because sitting inside these tin cans, as he calls them, which were like, you know, wood tech, you put an RPG, that would go straight through. It would ricochet around the inside and making hamburger of everyone, right? So they're really scary things to be trapped in. Colonel, what is going Basically, Garrison here is saying, we can't wait 45 minutes. We gotta go, you gotta do what you gotta do. And they did, they did what they had to do to extricate the body of, of Walcott. Talking about that and going back to the continual questioning I had from various journalists saying, why didn't you show the Delta and or and um, pilots of Durant's aircraft being dragged through the streets as it was seen on CNN. And I said very simply because that occurred the next day anyway. So it was out of the time zone of the event. But most of all, I knew that the wives and families were wives of young women still. And uh, the families, the mother and fathers. I mean, I, I didn't feel it was necessary. I knew exactly everybody should know what would happen next and what occurred, and therefore they should put two and two together. So that's the answer for that. But most of all, um, it didn't make sense in the time slot, in the time, you know, that it occurred. This is where they get to realizing that all the trucks are filled up with wounded, and stretches have taken up the interiors, and there's no room. And so the Drivers telling them to get on the roof, and they know that's they, they wouldn't last five seconds on the roof, so they decide to stick together and run out. 
you have to remember that this is the biggest firefight the Americans have been in um, since the Vietnam War, and very few people know that. We've had, um, you know, minor incursions into places like Grenada, and, but again, this still is, is the event that um, went on for 18 and a half hours uh, and cost 19 men, men's lives and, and about 1,000 of the Somalis. So it was a major event. Nobody knew about it. So this is the kind of picture that not only um, engrosses you and assaults you and makes you feel something, but it also informs you. It informs you of a, a certain period of time, uh, what, why, when, and where. Oh, this was also interesting. It stuck in my mind in the book, the little child in the arms of a grandfather, the child was bathed in blood, had been hit. And the grandfather had walked across in front of the convoy, and the convoy had rammed its brakes on and let the old man cross. And I could never forget that, and that was the last shot of the movie. I figured I had to do it. There's another dog, see that dog? That, these dogs kept running in shot, I didn't put them in shot. There's millions of little pet dogs there, which is great. The Moroccans love dogs, but unfortunately they don't really care for them. They're running around in the streets, living under, you know, wreckage and, and ruined houses. And, and in fact, there were eight dogs ended up in our art department. Eight dogs came back to the United States. Interesting here, one soldier, Kurth, couldn't shoot the female. So I thought, why not have um, our man who gets um, nearly killed by the boy and his father? Um, you know, somehow that made sense that he would, um, by hesitating, he could die again, right? And so at that moment, all's fair in war and war particularly when you have 10-year-old boys carrying a kit, and women having RPG launchers under their cloaks. The transition from the danger zone, the hostiles, to the friendlies, um, wasn't an exact line, or wasn't an exact piece of geography, but there was a moment where the firing stops, and they seem to run for a while in silence. And uh, I always thought what would be great would be to introduce the friendlies by having kids who really think this is all a bit of a game, and they're starting to be welcomed like the hero returns or the 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 end of the marathon right and uh because they said it was odd that they were having people were starting to cheer and give that muslim call of welcome and uh until they arrived in the stadium in the stadium they were faced with the wounded and the dead and of course they weren't being paid attention to because they were standing on their own two feet and therefore needed no attention until you have some Pakistani um, corporals come forward with clean uniforms, clean turbans, a tray of water, and Lee Van Arsdale still claims curry. They offered him curry and water. He said, I'll take the, I'll take the water, mate, not the curry. Then we have a film which turns around into something which is not really triumphant because it isn't. The outcome of the film is only questions. What was settled? What was sorted? You know, did we win? No. Did we lose? No. Did we lose some of our men? Yes. Does that constitute failure or, or loss? Is that loss classified as losing a battle? If that's going to be the demarcation of winning or losing, then these guys won by far because they lost 19 against somewhere between 500 and 1,000. So if you're gonna compare a head count and a body count with as to who wins and who isn't gonna win, or who hasn't won, which of course is ludicrous, right? 
So that question shouldn't arise. And it's reflected very much here on, on Eversman's face, who's starting to look bewildered. Ah, shit. Bullet missed your jugular by about three millimeters. Don't move. All right, all right. And of course, we'll soon come to what I think is the voice of the movie, which is, uh, you know, Eric Bana saying, um, well, there's two voices. Eric saying, uh, there's still men out there and uh, I got to go back out and do my job, do what I'm meant to do. It's all about duty and your fellow men. Um, this was added as an afterthought, but I love this, where, again, there is no triumph to this kind of uh, excursion. Um, there's only loss. And um, I love this idea of the general uh, being the spare part in the operating theatre and essentially almost being in the way. And somebody screaming, wipe up the blood, wipe up the blood, and they don't care, give a shit who does it. But, you know, Garrison, as a practitioner, as a practical man, without thinking, does it. It's nothing heroic in it. It's just his re reaction to what he has to do. Hey, Soren. Hey. Captain. Lorenzo. How you doing? We're well, winning now, so the medic said I should be okay. This is what Wiz actually said. He said, don't go out there without me, which I always thought was interesting, uh, even though Wiz actually finally died. Lost so much blood. Um, but he was... He clung onto steel with a vice-like grip and said, do not go out without me. I'm ready to go. You know, I need to rest, and then we'll go out again tomorrow. And it was so powerful that I figured we must do that. We must reflect that. And then finally to the, the meeting of Eversman and Hoot, who literally did this. This is not making it up. He went in, s got some food, replenished water, replenished explosives and supplies, and literally disappeared out of the stadium for three days, came back having marked up his own ordnance survey of the city and it said and pinpointed the position of three bodies, saying they're here. And they went out and got them. Um, uh, he felt that was his responsibility to do that. Understand why we do it. They just wouldn't understand, he says. They won't understand. You know, it's what we do. It's you know, about the man yet next year. So one wonders if um, he knows that, you know, anybody who has that view must be what I used to call, have a calling. Why would anybody be in the nursing profession, right? There has to be a calling, whatever the word is for it. It's not for the money, right? It's not, I mean, is it adrenalizing? Is it exciting? Is it on the edge? Certainly, whether you're in any one of these forces, militia or police or firemen or nursing profession, they're all underpaid. They all do a very aggressive and uh, job, which is a hard job to do. Clearly, they must feel they're making a difference. So, and I like to believe that. Um, and um, here we are now where the aircraft is a fully fledged play frame, where it will remain so, it probably is still there actually, in parts. Um, and this was always a scene that was a, put in the very last scene really was, uh, I, and I wanted Eversman to be talking to his buddies as if he was having a Coke or a cup of coffee and a cigarette in the bar or in the canteen. And you have no real idea what he's to, or who he's talking to, I hope, right? You didn't expect it, no. So, uh, so the talking, in, in fact, becomes about what are you, some kind of, thing, kind of war junkie, some kind of hero. Uh, no, nobody wants to be a hero. It just turns out that way sometimes. And, of course, he's talking to his uh, dead friend, Smithy. And I think it's a perfect epitaph for a film which supports this kind of militia and these kind of soldiers and these kind of 
characters, and I mean, and I mean characters with a capital C. Right? Okay, at the end here, um, obviously with the closing of the, the freighter with the caskets, um, we had, because of September the 11th, uh, had to address what do we do with the film? Do we push it back? Do we bring it forward? And it, the upshot was we, we decided to bring it forward because it was entirely relevant and would be relevant to what we felt would now happen, which would be these guys, these special forces, would certainly be used in Afghanistan, of course, which they are and they were and are still there and um, the only question really that arose was should we make the audience aware that had they been perceived as being successful in Somalia at the particular time in 93 uh, and that would have been by the geopolitical community if they'd had a nod of approval as to the success of the operation then maybe um, UN would have stayed in there in force and maybe a few American soldiers preferably UN would have stayed in there we had this bright idea about adding two cards or three cards at the end of the movie that basically said that this was considered a failure in American foreign policy and showed weakness. That's what one card said. Um, since then, it was Rwanda, Bosnia, Kosovo, Washington, New York, and the next card said um, that the special forces were now deployed in Afghanistan. So we had these three cards that kind of um, laid, laid out um, and, and referred to 9-11. Uh, but in the end, after we showed it to a number of journalists and a number of, uh, of civilians who half the people liked the cards and felt the cards were made it more emotional, the other half of the people said, look, the movie says it. Don't do it. And we erred on the side of caution and took it out. You know, 9-11 was a horrific event for the world and changed the way we live forever, uh, unfortunately, for, for all of us. Um, so, you know, you're devastated by it, and you, you're, you have no idea if there's something else coming. Uh, it creates enormous amount of tension. But, you know, when you look at what the firemen and the police and um, these really heroic individuals, um, you knew we were going to come out of it and we are going to get, um, get back to a normality, uh, which is, I think, we're getting to now, even though the threat is constant. It's always there and going to be vigilant, and that's what's so important about having a military and a very strong military, because if you have a strong military and you use it decisively, it kind of says to your detractors or your enemies, um, if you're going to do something, you're gonna, we're going to punch you right back. And for years we didn't send that message out. Uh, and I think now with uh, what Bush is doing in Afghanistan, even though it's going to be a long, drawn-out affair, um, he's, he's making a dent in these terrorist networks. On uh, September 11th, I was actually having my breakfast and talking to London, um, or trying to get through to London. My son, who was living in New York, in fact, was living two blocks from the uh, South Tower, where the debris had fallen onto his apartment block, and so he was never able to go return to the apartment block, and only allowed to go back in two months later to actually get his belongings. He called me up and saying, you better watch television because there's something quite unthinkable has occurred, and... Um, I switched on the TV and was stunned to see, you know, the images and the constant, constant replaying and replaying of what had just happened, and then to the collapsing of the buildings and uh, the whole hideous spectacle. You know, I think that we didn't know initially how it was going to affect the movie or what was going to happen. You're in too much of a shock over, over the, that event, and you're also, you're not sure what's going to come next. You don't know if the... The, um, there are more planes that are going to be hijacked or um, bombs going off or uh, more anthrax letters, which was the next threat. So people were, were uh, in, a, in a state of unease. Uh, but as far as the movie's concerned, you know, Ridley has a sense to drudge on. Of course, nobody came in the day of 9-11, but um, we knew we had to um, get the picture finished and get it ready for release. And Ridley was always an advocate after we, we screened the picture to get the picture out for awards. He really felt he had a shot. The exhibitor always wants to go out with as many prints as possible because if you go out in two or three theaters and the picture doesn't work, by the time you go to a wide release, you got you know three people showing up. Uh, so they were nervous. But what they did is Joe looked at the movie and said, I think we got something really powerful here. But when you see enough movies, you never really know. Uh, so he called up his, his friends at Sony and brought them in, and they said, God, this is a really powerful film. We decided that 
maybe come out in a couple theaters in December to qualify the picture in Ridley for Academy Awards and hopefully to take advantage of some of the top ten lists that were um, you know, there during the end of the year. Unfortunately for us, we got you know, we're number three of the films that were listed in the top ten of all the films. Uh, so that worked out well, and, and then we got nominated for four Academy Awards. When we decided then to get together, which would be Jerry and I talking and then talking to the studio revolution, I thought initially the worst, that we might have the film pulled and it would have to sit on a shelf somewhere until a distant future because of the general tone and you know of America at that particular point. Of course, the studio had seen the film, and then within about two days, I thought, well, why aren't we showing the film as soon as possible? And uh, I got onto Jerry, and we all seemed to have the same idea. So we, in fact, decided to go out sooner and therefore pull the film forward to as quickly as possible. So the meeting was, how fast can we get music done, the film mix, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, uh, if I'm going to do that, then I may as well really stretch it and get the film out for Academy nomination, which means you've got to get three prints out before December the 28th, 29th. That's what we did. It put tremendous pressure on everybody, but I think it was worth it. And uh, it was a call that we had to make. It was a dangerous decision, but I think it was the right decision because I think people were ready for this kind of film, which was clearly, uh, you know, a, a rather s very stressful film to watch. But it actually is a film which is very much out of and in respect for what these guys do. The reaction to the film was varied and. Um, in the United States, we've it's because, actually, by definition, this kind of budget and this kind of movie is really classified as very successful, of, in both financially and, I think, critically. The film wasn't acknowledged for Academy, but I was acknowledged for Academy as a director for the third time, which often makes me wonder, what do they think the director's doing when he's making the movie, and vice versa, where you get best film and not best director, or best director and not best film. It doesn't actually make sense, right? Um, but that's where the ballot box works and goes, so there's nothing you can do about that. But the film has played overseas less well, although it's rattled a lot of cages, um, hugely, and uh, was taken on board in the White House where President Bush was running it for guests, various carefully chosen guests, as a kind of real illustration and approval for American military, what they can do. But it's not a jingoistic you know, flag-waving film. And um, it's a film about re the realities of war and the realities of potential loss. And I think even so, abroad, there's still a lot of metaphorical eyeball rolling saying, oh, God, here go the Americans again with their jingoistic view on what they do, which, of course, infuriates me because I'm English and uh, and I made the movie, and so this is my view on it. And so... What I say to them, even to journalists abroad who say, you know, here's the American thing again, you know, we're going to go in there and we're going to kick butt. And I'm saying, well, mate, I didn't notice you going in there afterwards. I didn't. I haven't seen the Spanish in the, there. I haven't seen much of the French. I haven't seen much of the support from other, the other nations, uh, a bit from the English, uh, a bit of the UN. But essentially, the Americans are doing it all. And uh, that's what I've seen happen time and time again over the years. And I just think it is the lot of the community, of those who can afford to, should.